Hello, viewers. I am hoping you're safe wherever you are. I am hoping you're being quarantined. I am hoping you're washing your hands regularly, preferably after every hour. Now, I also like to advise you, viewers at home, that please ensure you sanitize and you actually keep your hands clean and avoid human content. Follow all the rules and regulations that the government is giving during these trial times. And I'm hoping we will overcome and come out as victorious. Now, as we all know, life has to go on. We have to learn. And today, my name, I have to introduce myself. My name is Mr. Anangwe Kevin Wilson. I teach English literature uh, in Bokolsun Academy. And today, I'd like to continue with the topic that we already began last time. Now, the topic of today is oral literature. We had looked at oral literature before. We had defined what oral literature is. Important points that we had mentioned last time is, first of all, number one, we had given the definition of what oral literature is. And as you said last time, oral and literature, these are two words which are actually the opposite of the other. Now, what do we mean by oral literature? Realizing oral literature is any performed art that is performed orally, any art that is performed by the word of mouth or verbally. So the first thing you should know is knowing the definition of, of oral literature. Number two thing that we had looked at the other time, we looked at the importance. Why do we actually learn about oral literature? And we had given some points. One of the most important points that should always be at your finger points or your fingertips, number one, it entertains. Eh? As we had already mentioned the other time, um, in those eras, the past eras, there was no any other form of entertainment. The only option of uh, our forefathers had was the use of oral literature. Let's say after a very long day of work, after they are tired from coming from the farm chambers and whatever, they would sit down, sing a song, uh, and the children will have to hear the narratives from their uh, grandparents. Number two, we said it passes on the culture of a community. Now, any particular culture, including you, view at home, I am hoping you have your own culture as an African. Now, realize this. Before the coming of the white person, we Africans had our own way of life. We were living even before uh, the white people came. So we say another post importance of, um, of oral literature is it passes down our culture as Africans from one person or from one generation to the next through oral literature. Now, these are just, just to mention a few or to recuperate on what we actually learned last time. So you should know at least, let's say, three or four importance of why we actually learn oral literature. We also say it, it educates. Now, what do we mean by educates? Now, realize this, this. In the olden days, there was no any other form of learning. The only option these guys had um, is oral literature. Let me give you a picture. Let me draw a very perfect picture for you so that you can get what I mean when, when I say oral literature was used to educate. Now, at least we have a system of education. We have a curriculum, a syllabus, which like for now, we are actually following. We have teachers like myself. We have institution like our schools where we go for learning. Now, this all this structure, what do I mean? Right now we have a system. We have a structure. There are some rules we follow. There is a syllabus of learning. So there is actually, you can say, I have started schooling and say I'm through with learning. Though we know learning is a process, so it, it might not end. Learning doesn't end. But what I mean is right now we have a system of learning. In those days, in our forefathers' days, there was no system, there was no curriculum, there was no personnel for uh, doing this job. But people have to learn. Learning is one of the things that a human being must do. Now, how did they learn? Realize they had their own cultures. They had their own values. They had their own, own uh, way of life. Now, why, how were they learning this? Oral literature played a very, very critical role when it came to this. Now, we moved on. Uh, number three, we looked at the artist. Now, what is an artist? As we said last time, an artist is a person who performs the literature. I will use a very um, um, nice example of nowadays. 
You guys have been born in an era where we have actors and actresses, right? Ever wondered why you can see one actor in more than one, two, three, four, five movies? Why is that? We are actually close to million human beings who are working on this green earth of ours. But we have a select number of people who actually do the acting. Why is it? They have a particular, uh, what can I say, uh, a ta uh, um, uh, quality that we look for when it comes to performing a particular uh, kind of artist or, or, or art. Now, this artist, if it was a story, let's say it's a narrative, eh? we had, as we had said last time, if this artist is going to perform a, a, a narrative, then we say this person now is called a storyteller. Yeah? Now, we had particular people who actually performed the act of storytelling. Now, if it was, let's say, a poem, a person who can make a poem or perform a poem, let's say it's a poet who is performing his own poem. And as we had said last time, language should be gender sensitive. Uh, we know girls and boys are equal. So if it is a poet, a poet is used for a male writer of a poem, and a poetess is used for the female version of the writer of a poem. Now, so say, let us use an example. Let's say the person who is performing a story, let's go with an experience. Let's say someone is a performing an oral narrative. Let's say we are calling the person, whether male or female, a storyteller. The other time we said there are some specific qualities we look for when it comes to a storyteller. Now, we call them qualities of a good story tell. Okay, now, number one, we had said number one, you should be confident. There is something that comes with confidence. If you're standing in front of people, right, like what I'm doing right now, you cannot be shy. Realize you might have the concept, you might have the content, you might have what to say, but how to say it is also very important. So confidence is one of the key things that the person should have be having. Number two, we said you should have good, good memory. Yeah, as we had discussed last time. Now, realize this. Memory plays a very critical role when it comes to oral narrative. Why am I saying this? We are calling it oral. As I had uh, said last time, uh, oral means word of mouth. Before the, the coming of writing and the literacy, as we can enjoy this now, um, there was no writing. For you to remember your stories, for you to remember your poems, for you to remember your tongue twisters, your proverbs, your sayings, you have actually to have a very sharp memory. Let's say, let's go with the narrative, which is a very good example. As we will realize later on, if we are covering this topic, and actually that is the next subtopic we are going to cover, a narrative is a very long thing. For you to tell this story, you have to be having a very, very, very uh, sharp kind of memory. Number three, should be fluent in speech. Now, I hope I am, I pray that I am uh, fluent in speech. What do I mean by fluent in speech? I should not tata or what offensive, tama, right? Um, if I'm speaking, I should ensure that my audience is getting whatever I am saying. So if you're saying it, ensure that your audience understands and gets whatever you are actually saying. Then another thing we said, um, we also say you should use a, a non-verbal, non-verbal, keto, roman, and verbal, non-verbal and verbal cues. Now, the other time I had clearly differentiated between the difference between as we learned in form two, the difference between verbal and non-verbal cues. What do we mean by verbal cues? Verbal cues are the things you can use when you're talking. For example, tonal variation, right? Number two, stress, right? So I can stress on particular words, ensure I use appropriate uh, uh, sound variation. Realize if you are to speak on the same tone, your speech would be very, very boring. It is very important that you ensure you actually vary your tone from one part to the other. Those are what we call verbal cues. 
Let us go on to non-verbal cues. Non-verbal cues are things that you can, are, are, are cues that you do without uh, using actually speech or paralinguistic devices. Now, how do you use that? Number one, there is the use of gestures. The use of gestures, as I'm doing right now. Now, there is a power of gesturing. Imagine this, if I was speaking like this. Good morning. How are you? How are you? Realize my speech will be very boring. I have to include in uh, the movement of gestures and hands so that my points could fall in as clearly as intended. Then we have the use of gestures and then something else. And the problem we usually have with our students is the confusion of the two. There is some called facial expressions. What do I mean by the difference between gestures and facial expressions? Now, gestures is things you use using your whole body. Like I can gesture like this and nod. Yeah? I can shake my head. But I must warn you, gestures vary from one community to the other. Let's take an example of Indians, for example. Indian will do like this. Like this. Meaning what? Yes. Right? He's getting. But other people will do like this, will do a nod to ensure that they are getting. Then a shake of a head means no, right? And then there is other gestures like this, yeah? Like stop, yeah? like go, like a thumb, right? The use of a thumb or a lower thumb. So these are what we call gestures. You're using whole, the whole body. Now, what do we mean by facial expression? What's the difference now of a facial expression? Now. When you communicate with you, the use or the help of your only face. Now that is what <coughs> we refer to as a facial expression. Now facial expression includes green, sneer. Hmm? When you just, let's say you walk into a room, then someone sneers like this, right? So sneering, wink, right? A smile. And let me just say this, each non-verbal or verbal cue has its own message that they convey. So if you're a good storyteller, we expect that you manipulate uh, what we call the non-verbal and the verbal cues. Now, this is just as a reminder, to serve as a reminder of what we had learned last time, but there is something now, the topic of today, that I want us to do, um, or a continuation of where we left, and that is the genre of oral narrative. Uh, very important. So the topic of the day is genres of oral narrative, or oral literature, sorry, oral literature. Now we have different segments of different oral literatures and uh, subdivisions of this. Now number one, number one uh, genre is oral narrative. This should be number one. When we look at oral narrative, what is oral narrative? Um, genres of oral narrative, what do we mean by oral narrative? This should be number one. Number two, there is something we call songs, or sometimes we refer as oral philology. Uh, there is a small discrepancy between songs and oral poetry. And I have actually to reiterate or emphasize on this. This usually confuses our students. Songs, which is supposed to be done in uh, form two, we actually did, which is also one genre of uh, oral uh, literature. Then there is oral poetry. Now, what is the difference between poems and songs? There is something else you realize is, uh, which is kind of the same. Poems and songs are, have the same structure, are written the same. They have the same. What do I mean by the same? They are not written in prose. They are written in things we call stanzas. Now, the only difference between a poem and a song is songs are performed with a musical encampment. A musical encampment. What do I mean by this? When a song is being performed, there is usually a musical a background of music which follows in. That is the opposite of uh, poetry. A poetry is just um, recited uh, uh, without musical uh, encampments. Though there is something called also oral poetry, um, oral poetry is very close to songs. They might have background uh, music, like the way these uh, spoken artists these days do. They usually follow it with some um, musical encampment to 
to, to follow the poem. And what is the purpose of a musical encampment in a song or in a poem? Number one, they are meant to emphasize a feeling. Yeah? Let's say this. Um, someone is performing a sonnet. And in our study of sonnet, we saw sonnet is a poem about love. And then there is a very nice beat um, or a music encampment in the background. Realize even the feeling is emphasized, right? So that is the sole purpose. And then there is something called rhythm, right? As we did poetry, we, decided, we discussed something like alliteration, rhyme and rhyme schemes and consonants and assonance. Those are another aspects that I'll not look at. Malimu had already discussed. Also, we'll also discuss that in other classes as we progress. Now, um, the alliteration and uh, rhyme schemes and rhyme are meant to ensure that there is rhythm uh, when there is a musical encampment. Realize, think of any song, any song that you can think about. Realize they'll always re uh, uh, rhyme, rhythm, and repetition, and a lot of alliteration. The purpose is meant for them to go with the musical encampment because of the rhythm. Wherever there is rhyme, there is rhythm. And wherever there is rhythm, there is musicality. Hence, the music comes in. Then number four, three, sorry, we have the riddles. Example, we discuss this in time uh, to see what riddles is all about. And we, as, we dis, uh, as we shall see, a riddle requires two parties. You cannot do a riddle as one person. You must be more than one for you to have a riddle. Then number four, we have what we call proverbs. Huh? Proverbs are what we actually call them wise Then One. So proverbs or wise sayings. And then these things usually they have a vague at the meaning, right? Um, and then there is usually two parts, a proportion, a pro uh, uh, proposition, and then a, a conclusion. Like for example, Hari Hari. A, po a, riddle, a, po a proverb is usually divided in two parts. Again, we'll discuss this. Hari Hari, usually there is now the other part, has no blessing, right? A stitch in top of energy saves nine. Now, we also have to understand that uh, proverbs usually, as I've said, they usually have veiled meaning. There is what you call literally meaning and literal meaning. Um, and most of the time they are meant to convey the hidden message in the, in the proverb. Like someone, if someone says, say this, if the deal is too good, Think what? Twice, right? Now realize, as much as it's talking about a deal, there is more to it than just uh, uh, the surface meaning as we see. Now that should be number five. Number four, then number five, there's what we call puns, or wordplay. Again, a very interesting hit when it comes to oral narratives. And then there is tongue, Twisters. Tongue, we call as, as the word suggests, tongue twisters. It twists the tongue. It is meant to improve in the pronunciation of a word. For example, as I said the other time, and I'll give another example of a tongue twister. Let's say this. If two witches are watching two watches, which witch is watching which watch? If two witches are watching two watches, which witch is watching which watch if two witches are watching two watches which witch is watching which watch now try saying that uh, let's say five times faster and say this five times you realize you might even bite your tongue that's why they are called tongue twisters uh, if can tie can tie a tie why can tie tie a tie like can tie tie the tie now realize those are what we call tongue twisters uh, so this is just to mention a few of what we call oral, uh, uh, the genres of oral narrative. But for today, there is only one we will uh, emphasize on, and that is oral narrative. Today we will keep focus more. Focus will be on oral narrative uh, as our topic today. I'm hoping you have written the genres of oral narrative. Now, first one we are going to tackle today is, uh, as we have seen, oral narrative. Now, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say? Oral narrative. What is this? Now, basically, just before I give uh, a very long definition, let me just give an easier explanation to this. Oral narrative is basically a story told in prose. What do we mean by prose? 
continuity. Continuity is mostly written in paragraphs. So you'll find a narrative as it is opposed or different to other uh, forms or genres of oral literature, you'll find oral narratives are a little bit longer. They have a setting. What do we mean by a setting? Some have, but like you'll realize, as different. The difference between oral literature and let's say a riddle will be number one, oral literature are prose narration. There is prose, there is narration. Whenever you hear narration, there is one thing that comes to mind, long, right? So what's the difference between this genre and the other genres of oral narrative? You'll find out oral literature is a little bit longer compared to the other genres of oral literature. There is also we, so what you call setting. <coughs> what is setting? Um, we have uh, just emphasizing on narration. Setting is the environment where the story takes place. Now let's say this. If someone is telling you a story that one day I woke up, I was feeling a little bit tired. I was coughing. Uh -huh. I was sneezing. My temperature was high. Which, which, uh, uh, which caused me to go to the doctor. I hope you see which, uh, these are uh, symptoms for which disease? Coronavirus. So I woke up uh, and I went to the hospital and discussed this with the doctor. The doctors uh, uh, had to quarantine me in a safe room. Now, in this room, it's a ward, a private ward, where I, uh, I was injected by drugs. Now, before I even continue, what is the setting of this story? This story setting is in a hospital. Why? We have had a doctor, a ward, patient, syringe, injection. Now, the words in a story will give you a setting. As we will continue as from now, as I'm giving examples, you will realize each story will have what we call a setting, the environment where the story took place. And then, uh, there will be something else which we'll introduce in the narration. What will we introduce? There's something we call, we have said, um, oh, setting. We'll have a setting right here. A setting we said is the environment where the story is taking place. Uh, we said pro is treated in culture. Uh, pro just means progress. Then there is something else it also includes what we call character. Is characters. Characters come from the word character. Character is an either true or invented uh, persona, a persona in a story, right? Narrators invent characters in order as a vehicle. Narrators invent characters as a vehicle in order for them to carry their theme in their story. And in each narration, there is a theme. No. As we are saying, there is a setting. In that setting, realize we had a patient. A patient is a character. Now, in every narration, we will be having what we call a character. A character is a person who plays a role in each particular narration. And also say this, before I continue, in oral narrative, as we really realize, we have said it can be a true character or an imagined. For example, in oral narrative, you realize in our stories, we'll have hares that speak, elephants that speak, right? They have a family. Animals are given uh, qualities of a human being. So they can, as I say, they can be true or imagined. So we'll have pros, we'll have a setting, and we'll have characters. Now, without further ado, let us give the definition. Let us write this. Uh, as the definition so that we can have some few notes uh, to take uh, uh, in the purposes of um, revision. So let us write this. What are oral narratives? These are pros. These are pros accounts. These are pros. Please underline pros. Pros accounts of events. These are pros Account of events, people, objects, and animal representative 
of non-renewable energy, we have one theme of human characters. Of human characters. In bracket, personification. If I were you, as I've said, I would underline pros, then I would underline personification. There is another word that comes in, personification. Okay, before we even uh, define what personification is, these are pros accounts of events, people, objects, and animals representative of human beings in bracket personification what does that mean in our stories the stories will pros will be pro in pros form and as i've explained before in pros form we mean in continuity they will be in paragraphs con in continuous form that is number one number two i have mentioned animal representative of human characters there's something i'll also mention and i think i mentioned this in our earlier classes literature is basically a mirror when you look in a mirror what do you see yourself so a mirror is simply a, a mirror is simply showing a representation of who, of who you are now literature has been used or oral literature has been used uh, by people to actually mirror things that are going on in our society now in some of these stories you will find there are some animals which have been personified what do we mean personification or personif personified personification comes from the word person now let us define personification okay. what do we mean by this very long term this is when object So beings are given traits or characteristics are given characteristics characteristics of human beings. Human beings. When man, human objects or beings are given characters of human beings. Now, you'll find a cow having a characters of human beings. You'll find a hair. And most of these, they use hairs and hyena. Now, let me use that as an example. You'll find a hair is talking. A hyena has a family. Hyena reasons, which we know in real life is not true. Now, there's some aspects which we'll introduce here. There is something I want you to understand here. We all know it is impossible for a hair to speak. Hence, there is an aspect of fantasy which will be introduced here. And I will need you as a student to understand. Fantasy is not real world. It is out of this world. Out of a real life. For fantasy, it will be shown in oral narrative. You will see animals speaking, having family. Two, Given characters of human beings. Let me ask you a question. Why can't we use, if you said it is a mirror, right? If you look in a mirror, you should see an object of yourself. Why are we not using human beings? Why are you getting into the trouble of using animals and other things or other uh, non object things? This is the reason why. Sometimes, as we'll see, literature is used to um, rectify, right? Uh, things that is happening wrong in the society. Let's say this. Let's use your example as a student. You are in class. There is a guy who is the biggest guy in that class. He is the bully. And you know very well if you are to uh, go head to head with this guy, this guy will actually harm you. You want to correct his behavior. You want to tell him that you are a bad guy without harming yourself. How would you do that? You use your thinking. Now, get that character, that bully. He takes your lunch, he beats you up. Uh, he's the noisemaker in class. He's greedy, right? 
Now, which animal do you think is huge and greedy? Think about an animal which is a clear representation of this bully. Let's say an elephant, right? So you say, one day they lived an elephant. Realize, you know, this particular person is Ahmed. But you don't want to say Ahmed. Why? Ahmed might harm you. So you say, one day they live an elephant. This elephant used to harm his all uh, fellow animals. Step on mouth. Uh, take their lunch. Chase them away. Bully them. He was greedy. Right? Now realize, Ahmed might be in the midst of your narration. But he might not realize that this whole story is all about who? Him. Now at the end, mostly at the end of each oral narrative, in fact, in, at the end of all nar every nar oral narrative, there is what you call moral lesson. Moral lesson. Something that someone learns at the end of your narration. Let's say Ahmed was there. He was listening to what elephant was doing to hair and uh, mouth and rabbit. And most of the time, it doesn't end well for the, for the bad character in the story. Now, Ahmed will sit down and realize, I have been doing wrong. I might want to end, as who? end up as who? The, uh, uh, the elephant. What am I saying? These characters in the stories are symbolical. And this brings me to the next thing. You will see a lot of symbolism in oral narratives. Symbolism is when you use another thing. Let me use an example of our Kenyan national flag. In our Kenyan national flag, we have various colors. We have red, we have white, we have red, and we have green. Red is simply a color. There is nothing much about color red. But when the red color is placed on a flag, it, it, it symbolizes the blood that we shed during the fight for our uh, independence. When we see white, simply like this coat, means nothing. But if it is placed, let's say, in a, white, in a flag of Kenya, it symbolizes peace. Now, symbolism, you have said, is a use another thing to show another. So if you use the elephant, uh, the hyena, we know, we all know if there's an animal hyena somewhere, what does it represent? Of course, greed. Yeah? We all know that hyena is greedy. So if someone uses hyena in this, most probably, most probably is because of the greed of that character in a story. So this is basically the definition of what we call um, uh, oral narratives. Now, there is something else I'll move on. What is so distinct, what is so different about oral uh, literature that, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> for that, that makes this one different from other genres, oral literature? I'm hoping you've written the definition. I'll move on to features. Features of oral. Oral narrative. But before I give features of oral narrative, let us warm our brain. Let us think. I have a question for you, audience. And I will give you about uh, 40 seconds to think about this and answer. My question is, what is the difference? What is the difference between oral literature and oral narrative? What is the difference, actually four differences, between oral nar uh, literature and oral narratives? The difference between oral literature and oral narratives. I'll give you a few seconds to think about that as we continue. The difference between oral literature and oral narratives. Oral literature and oral narratives. Very good. Do you have differences? Mm -hmm. Now, if you are a keen student, you might have realized there is no difference between oral literature and oral narrative. Oral narrative is a genre of oral literature. Oral uh, narrative is just a genre under what? 
oral literature. So please don't be confused. I usually tell students, if you read and revise, if you know, you know. Now let us move on to uh, what we call uh, features of oral narrative. What is different in oral narrative that you might not find in other, other uh, genres of oral, or oral literature? Number one, there is the aspect of timelessness. Aspect of timelessness. What do we mean by timelessness? Now realize oral narrative usually begin with something like long, long ago. Once upon a time. They are once lived. Now when is their once lived? When? When is that particular time? When is once upon a time? Realize this. The reason why we use this kind of things that is also another feature of oral narrative is because there is no time when it comes to oral literature. What do I mean by timelessness? The reason why we say timelessness, number one, these stories are relevant at any particular time. What do I mean any particular time? The narratives you're hearing now were told decades and decades and decades before you were born, but they are still relevant now. Let's say the narrative about the hyena who found two ways he was walking on the road. Okay, let me begin and tell you an example. Once they lived a hyena, he was walking down the road. This is a very famous oral narrative. As he was walking down the road, he had a very nice aroma that made him to salivate. He had not eaten for the past two days. It was during a dry, dry season and there was no food uh, and water. This attracted his nose. He said, hmm, this is a very nice smell. I must reach there before they finish eating. Hyena followed the smell. Now running, right? When he reached a place, he found these different separate ways going separate ways. He did not find, it was not easy for him to decide which way to go. He decided, two of my legs will walk this road, another two of my legs will walk during this path. Before he reached very far, what happened to the hyena? He split into two and died. This is a story was, that was told years and years back. But realize this, is it relevant to us now? Do we still learn something from this story now? Yes. What do we learn? Don't be what? Don't be greedy. So there is an aspect of timelessness as a, as a feature of oral narrative that we say timelessness. Number two, there is fantasy. What do we mean by fantasy? Fantasy is something which is not real. I'll give you a very basic example of you students of this generation, the 22nd generation. There's something we call Disney World. Is Disney World real? Is it a virtual thing, right? It's not real. It's something imagined, sci-fi, something out of reality. Now, as I said, uh, we'll have personification in oral narrative, so we expect a lot of fantasy things which are not really true in real life. Number three, moral lessons in each oral narrative in each oral narrative you will find a moral lesson what do we mean as we said in the past days there was no school no formal uh, form of education now how are they learning this is how they were learning through more, uh, uh, these things that we call narratives in this narrative they had to learn lessons like realize in a story that we have just uh, had now we have learned as a student as a human being you're not supposed to be what to be greedy so each oral narrative has a moral lesson let me point out something before we continue i'm giving this in point form let me caution you in an examination scenario if you're given examination and in form three we already know there is paper one there is paper two there is paper three at the end of this topic i will show you how to answer questions in paper one and paper two but basically in form three we insist how to answer papers in 101 stroke one that is what we call paper one as students now in paper one 
uh, or in any other exam. Let's say the examiner says this, and that is a problem we have with most of our students. Most of our students act like robots. If you are given these notes like this, and you're given a question about character, uh, character qualities of uh, oral narrative, you don't have to copy and paste. What do I mean copying and pasting? Let's say this, the question the examiner asks you like this. I explain three features, though I'll add more, features of oral narrative. If you say, and let's say six marks, realize if you are supposed to explain timelessness, I explained. You're not supposed to write this, no. You need to add other explanation. For example, you can say they are relevant through all time because they are not specified to a given duration of time. They can be relevant through this generation and in the next generation. So I must warn you as examiners, please answer the question that you're given. These are the answers, yes. But please consider, answer the questions you're given. Read the instructions in the exam paper and answer them uh, however is needed by the examiner. Now, um, let us continue with features of oral narrative. You said there are moral lessons. As I said, at the end of any narrative, you'll find there is a lesson you learn. There is something new you get. There's a direction you're given. Let us continue. That is number three because of space I'll have to write and I'm hoping you're taking notes. Then, that was number three. Number four, number four quality of oral, uh, 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 oral narrative. They have an opening formula. They have an opening formula. For example, example you'll find like once upon a time. Then the story continues. Long, long ago. Or sometimes they say long time ago. Right? Then the story continues. Now, these are just examples of what we call opening formulas. So, as I was saying, we have opening formula. We said once upon a time, long, long ago, and a long time ago. These are just examples of uh, opening formula. Though I must say, opening formula has their own functions in oral narrative. They have a role that they play. Which role do they play? We are still under features, but I'll have you write functions. Huh? Functions of an opening functions of an opening formula why why do we have an opening formula why is it necessary let me give you an example let's say news all of us do watch news right there is a tone that comes before the news begins that tone yeah if you, let's say you are walking around or whatever, you're doing your own things, and then the tone comes, tone, tone, tone. Why do they put that before the news begin? Number one, realize it is meant to capture your attention, right? If you are doing something that is not important, you actually sit down, relax, and now concentrate. Find out what is going on, right? That is number one. Number two, um, and as I will, I will give, as I'll give as many as, as, as I can get. Um, next time we continue because of time, I'm being informed time is not on our side. Next time we will begin from functions of an opening formula um, um, and I'll give several, then we'll move on to other features. Realize we are not done with the features of oral narrative. We will finish the features of oral narrative. I'll be a function of opening formula and then we will uh, continue from there. Now, just a summary of what we have learned today. Today we have recuperated or we have tried to remember whatever we actually learned the other time and that is the introduction to oral narratives, functions of oral narrative and artists, uh, qualities of a, a good artist. Then we moved on, then we learned about genres of oral literature, we learned about six, we said riddles, proverbs, uh, we moved on, we started on oral narratives, then we gave qualities, we are now giving qualities uh, of oral narrative, we even defined what oral narrative is all about. Now, an assignment, which I'll give, an assignment, and I expect that you do this, we will continue from there. Assignment. Just one question. Give six qualities. 
gives six qualities of a good story teller give six qualities of a good story teller six marks give six qualities of a good storyteller have a nice day